Shane Van Gisbergen confirms he's coming to America. And if recent reports are true, much of what we thought we knew about NASCAR silly season is about to change. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove, a jam-packed episode of Out of the Groove. We've got driver signings to talk about. A charter may actually be for sale. We've got drivers subtweeting each other on social media. So much to get to and a whole lot more. I also want to talk about Bristol and take a close look at that cutoff line at the end of this episode. But first, we have to thank our sponsor, Hampton Farms, a great source of protein grown right here in the United States. And just like NASCAR, Hampton Farms just celebrated their 75th anniversary last fall. Good for your heart, high in protein, something about eating traditional in-shell peanuts is just nostalgic. You can find Hampton Farms peanuts in the produce section of your local grocery store. And Hampton Farms wants you to get nutty with them on social media. You can follow them on both Instagram and TikTok at Hampton Farms Peanuts. Huge thank you to Hampton Farms for sponsoring this episode of Out of the Groove. This entire episode is going to be nuts. (laughs) Let's start here. I was at Michigan International Speedway last month. And I remember Brad Keselowski, co-owner of RFK Racing, told the media that there are no charters for sale. Plenty of interest from folks not only within the Cup Series already, but also outside suitors. But according to Brad Keselowski, they'd all been told that their money is no good. That was a month ago. A report last night from Adam Stern, Sports Business Journal, calls all that into question. Live Fast Motorsports has declined comment on NASCAR industry chatter that it could sell its charter soon, with Spire Motorsports seen as among the suitors. Among the options Spire would have with the charter is helping a team like Trackhouse if it needed a spot for Zane Smith in 2024. Wow, that completely changes the narrative. Because between this report what Bob Pachris reported yesterday, and recent comments made by Zane Smith himself, where there's smoke, there's fire. We covered this yesterday, but in case you missed it, earlier this week, Bob Pachris, writing for Fox Sports, wrote this. Zane Smith has talked to several cup teams, including Trackhouse Racing, according to sources, but Trackhouse doesn't have a spot for him in 2024, so any deal with Trackhouse would likely be a situation where he is leased out to another team for next season, possibly Cup or Xfinity. Hmm, okay. First, we'd heard Zane Smith and Trackhouse mentioned in the same sentence. Zane Smith was on Sirius XM NASCAR radio yesterday and said this. These are his own words. Quote, my deal is done and I know what I'm doing. Hopefully the news will come out this week or sometime soon. We're working hard on getting an announcement out. It was signed last week. It's everything I ever wanted and I'm super excited about it. Everything I ever wanted. Remember, there were rumors a couple years ago that Zane Smith had signed a Cup Series deal with Chip Ganassi Racing before Chip Ganassi ultimately sold their two charters to Trackhouse. And Trackhouse opted to put Ross Chastain in their car instead. Hmm, now you have a report from Adam Stern that Spire Motorsports may be interested in Live Fast Charter and could lease it out to Zane Smith and Trackhouse. One after another, all these reports, all these quotes have come out this week. There's got to be something there. I don't have any additional insight. I'm just looking at all the public information and I'm connecting the dots. Where there's smoke, there's fire. And this silly season rumor is ablaze right now. So much is happening here. Spire buying a third charter is a little surprising because just two years ago, they sold two charters to Colleague. Gainbridge recently signed on as a major primary sponsor for Spire Motorsports. And I want to put sponsor in quotes. I think this sponsorship is way bigger than it initially appears. Someone on the NBC broadcast this week called it a a financial partnership. It may have been Steve Letarte because I know he's been a consultant at Spire. But remember, Corey LaJoy recently signed a multi-year deal with Spire despite reportedly having offers from other bigger, more established teams. Spire Motorsports and Gamebridge are cooking something over there. This isn't just Gamebridge signing on to have their logos all over the car. No, this is much bigger than that. I think Spire now has more cash on hand than we realize. Hopefully it translates to better on-track performance in the near future. Would not be surprised if Spire does in fact acquire Live Fast Charter and potentially leases it out to Trackhouse, or Trackhouse leases their 
potentially new driver Zane Smith out to Spire for a year to get some Cup Series experience. All these reports coming out all at once, there's something there. As far as Live Fast, if they are indeed selling their charter, I've gotten to know both BJ McLeod and Matt Tift a little bit earlier this year, especially back around Darlington in May. They were nice enough to let me come check out their shop. Matt Tift gave me a little behind the scenes tour. I did a video on this channel. I think that group's awesome. I think it's really cool what they've been able to build, but let's just be honest, the on-track performance has not improved over the past three years. Like, I think they've maybe improved on the stopwatch, but so is every other team. So Live Fast is still in last place. If charters are truly going for, you know, 40, 50 million dollars a pop, even if you have to split that three ways between BJ McLeod, Matt Tift, Joe Falk, or whoever controls that charter, like that's still a lot of money to go around. And if you're a guy like BJ McLeod, who also has an Xfinity series team, that's a ton of cash potentially that you could choose to invest into that organization. And the 78 car on the Xfinity side with Anthony Alfredo, when they avoid trouble, have actually had some pretty good runs this year. They were able to run top five, top 10 at super speedways. They're leading laps. So if they choose to hold on to their charter, good luck to them. I hope they continue to improve. But if they do sell their charter, hey, I'm no expert, but money is money. <laughs> I wouldn't blame them. But moving on, only somewhat because uh, Trackhouse was in the news late last night. If you're like me and you live here in the United States, if you live in New Zealand, this news broke early this morning. SVG is coming to America. Trackhouse says he'll race in a combination of NASCAR's three national series in 2024. That's right, it's official. It's been rumored, it's been discussed for a while now, but now it's confirmed. Shane Van Gisbergen, the Chicago street race winner from earlier this summer, will move to America and race here full-time beginning in 2024. They mentioned all three NASCAR series. Uh, according to Trackhouse, he'll also make some late model starts at different events throughout the year as well. In a press release, Justin Marks, owner of Trackhouse, said, quote, This is going to be a tremendous challenge for Shane, but he is a tremendous driver, as we have all seen. Next year will be about getting him acclimated to oval track racing, super speedways, mile and a half tracks, and everything he has never experienced in his career. It's obviously going to be a learning process, but we think Shane will perform quite well. There has been no official word as far as you know which races he's going to do in each series, which teams he may drive for, especially in Xfinity and trucks, but this is happening, and it's going to be a challenge trying to cram a lifetime's worth of oval racing experience into a 34-year-old driver is going to be tough. I think Trackhouse is going about this in a good way, though. It, it would have been very difficult for Shane Van Gisbergen to just come over to the States, jump into a cup car full-time, and be competitive. It would have been difficult to not develop bad habits, get demoralized when the results weren't there. I still think Shane Van Gisbergen could have been a playoff threat just because of the win in your end format. He could have won any of the road courses, but outside the road courses, it would have been a struggle. So I do think Trackhouse is going about this the right way. They have connections to Nice Motorsports in trucks, uh, colleague, I guess, in Xfinity. And, you know, based on those recent rumors we were just talking about, maybe even Spire, who has both the truck and Xfinity series team. Just taking a step back for a moment, Trackhouse has been around not even three years. And to see what they've done to not only grow their own brand, but also grow NASCAR's brand simultaneously is incredible. For years, NASCAR's tried to get fans to embrace this next generation of drivers. Ross Chastain has done it. Trackhouse has brought international stars and eyeballs into NASCAR with obviously SVG, but also Kimi Raikkonen. Pitbull as you know, an investor, an ambassador, like much of what Trackhouse doing may be considered unorthodox, but they are exactly what this sport needed at exactly the right time. It's hard to be too critical of what Justin Marks, Ty Norris, the entire Trackhouse team, what they've built in such a short amount of time. But back to SVG, I guess, you know, if the Zane Smith rumors are also true, all of a sudden Trackhouse is going to have Ross Chastain, Daniel Suarez, who both just signed multi-year contract extensions, alongside Zane Smith, who's proven he's ready to go full-time cup racing, and Shane Van Gisbergen, three-time Supercars champ, uh, won in his first ever cup start, like, you know, not going full-time cup racing next year, but before long, I think that's the goal. That's the plan. Trackhouse only has two charters, so I'm not sure how they'll find room for all four of these guys if the Zane Smith rumors turn out to be correct. But 
I guess that's a good problem to have. It's always better to have a surplus of talented people than you know, be at a talent disadvantage. I'm really curious to see what kind of schedule Trackhouse builds for Shane Van Gisbergen. You know, obviously the road courses, he could win any one of them, so he should probably run those. Why not? But on the cup side, at least, I'd like to see him do the Daytona 500, at least attempt to qualify for it. It's the biggest race, biggest audience, biggest purse. Why not? Travis Pastrana was kind of thrown to the wolves this year in an open car, qualified for the show, and was running top 10 on the last lap. I wonder if they'll have SVG run Darlington. Dude's been oval racing for like five minutes. They throw him out into the Southern 500. That would be cruel. <laughs> I'll be curious to see what sort of schedule they craft, but uh, road courses, Daytona 500, those seem like no-brainers. Let's move on. In just a moment, I want to talk about Bristol, the night race, one of my favorite evenings of the entire year. I've got a new uh, scientific instrument I'm going to display when talking about the playoff drivers, the bubble drivers, who has the best chance of advancing to the round of 12. We'll break that out in just a moment. But first and foremost, I get hundreds of comments every single video from all of you. Let's take one of your comments now from out of the crowd. This is from two videos ago. We were talking about NASCAR's decision to bring back stage cautions for the Charlotte Roval road course race next month. I played y'all a clip from Joey Logano a couple weeks back where he supported that idea, and uh, a few of y'all in the comments responded. I like this comment from Dicastic Dad 4261 They said, Joey Logano wanting a chance at more restarts? Who would have thought it? <laughs> Although Reddick is giving him quite a run for his money as far as getting the most bang for the buck on restarts, a hybrid of various road course strategies they've used this year could work best. Race with stage break cautions, but have single file restarts at every road course. I'm not quite so sure about the second half of that uh, comment, uh, but the first part of that comment about Joey Logano is actually a good point. It's kind of amusing. Now, yesterday, Joey Logano once again voiced his support of NASCAR bringing stage cautions back to the Charlotte road course. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that I saw Rodney Childers, Kevin Harvick's crew chief, kind of said the same thing. He's a fan of it. But what's funny is Michael McDowell who, unlike the number 22 and number four teams, has actually won a road course race in the last five years. He actually threw some social media shade Joey Logano's direction yesterday. Here is his tweet. Some like it, stage cautions at road courses, because it gives them an opportunity to make something happen on a restart, like stuffing it five wide bumper car style. It also erases the time gap lost on track due to the lack of actual speed. It gives the guys who can't run up front all day a shot at it. Indoor karting is entertaining too. Entertainment is subjective, so I am good if the fans want it, but is this what the fans really want? Dang, that was brutal. Um, but he's not wrong. He's exactly right. I said it earlier this week. If the next-gen car was worse at road course racing, interestingly enough, the racing would actually be better. The action, the amount of passing would be greater. And then we may not need stage cautions to artificially bunch the field back up every 30 laps. But the car isn't perfect. I think NASCAR knows that. So they're bringing stage cautions back because they don't want their precious playoff cutoff race to be an hour and 58 minutes long with only one caution for incident and the leader winning by like five seconds, a la what happened at Watkins Glen a few weeks ago. But I appreciate the comment. I also appreciate Michael McDowell ooh, being brutal on social media. Um, but now let's talk Bristol. The Roval is a few weeks away. Bristol is more pressing. The final race, the cutoff race for the round of 16. Saturday night under the lights, Goodyear is debuting a new right side tire. It was tested uh, back in June. It's supposed to wear out faster, create more tire fall off. It's also worth noting that the cup cars will run the intermediate aero package this week and not the same aero package that's run at other short tracks like Martinsville, Richmond, or even flat tracks like New Hampshire and Phoenix. This is the same package that was run at Dover. Gateway, Nashville, just worth noting, you know, Bristol is its own beast. So when I'm looking at stats and trying to compare, it's hard to compare Bristol to any other racetrack. And we've only raced here once in the next gen era. So I don't have a lot of information to go off of. So when I make my round of 16 into the round of 12 picks, I'll do my best. But what I want to do here today is look at the playoff grid. And in my opinion, there's 12 or 13 drivers who are not safe could easily have something go wrong and fall outside of the top 12. I want to look at a bunch of these drivers and I'm going to break out my all new advanceometer, advanceometer. Maybe that's a better word for it. I don't know. It's a new tool I'm uh, testing out. On a scale of one to 10, I will tell you how 
confident I am in this driver, this team advancing to the next round of the playoffs. Pretty simple, right? Let's get started at the bottom with Michael McDowell. He's 40 points out, and for that alone, I'm giving him a 1 out of 10 on the advance a meter His best finish ever at Bristol was a 10th back in 2020, but he did finish 11th in this race last year, and he has been better at the shorter ovals this year than many of the larger ovals. So don't completely count out Michael McDowell. I'm not going to give him a 0, but I got to give him a 1 because he has to win. Next up on the advance meter is Ricky Stenhouse Jr., now he's 22 points out. That is a significant deficit, but I'm going to jump his odds up to a three on the advance meter scale. People forget how great Ricky Stenhouse Jr. was at Bristol when he was in Roush Fenway equipment, back when Roush Fenway was not very good. He was second and sixth at Bristol in 2014, fourth in 2015, second in 2016, ninth in 2017, and fourth in 2018. Throw in a second at Bristol Dirt a couple years ago for good measure. Look, this year, I think Stenhouse has been a little better on the bigger ovals than the shorter ovals, but his past Bristol success in non-playoff equipment, arguably, uh, should be noticed. I'm giving him a 3 out of 10. Next up is Bubba Wallace. I think he has just one top 10 at Bristol. Last year, he was 29th. Bubba Wallace has three top fives this year, and they all came at intermediate tracks. And actually, he doesn't have a top five since Charlotte back in May. The flat tire at Kansas last week was a gut punch. That was his chance to make up points, maybe even contend for a win. It didn't happen. I don't think Bubba Wallace makes it out of this round. I'm giving his odds a two out of 10. Now we have Martin Truex Jr., an interesting pick. He was my championship pick after a catastrophic race at Kansas. He is seven points below the cut line. And historically, Martin Truex Jr. has not been very good at Bristol. He had, a, it was either a power steering or an engine problem in this race one year ago. Remember, he like flipped off his car's engine. <laughs> Martin Truex Jr. does not have a top five finish at Bristol since his Michael Waltrip racing days. That was a long, long time ago. But I'm giving Martin Truex a six on the advance o meter because he won at Dover earlier this year. Another concrete track, same intermediate rules package. At more traditional short tracks, remember he was leading late at Richmond in the spring, finished third at Martinsville. Seven points isn't much to make up. I think Martin Truex Jr. will advance to the round of 12. I think they've gotten all their bad luck, the bad vibes out of the way early. So now let's talk about Kevin Harvick, who right now holds on to the final transfer spot, seven points above the cut line. I'll put Harvick at a five on the advance meter He's a three-time Bristol winner, winning the night race in both 2016 and 2020, but obviously his car is not nearly as good now as it was back then. So I look at his recent short track success. Hey, he was 10th at Bristol last year. He was also 5th and 10th at Richmond the two times they went there this year, so doesn't really have any other similarities with Bristol other than they're both short tracks, but I'm trying to stay optimistic. But if I had to pick between Truex and Harvick, I think Truex leapfrogs Harvick Saturday night. Unless a driver further up has a catastrophic issue, let's move one driver up to Joey Logano in 11th. He's got two Bristol wins, but you got to go all the way back to 2015 to find him. He's been good at short tracks this year, though, and short ovals. Logano was second at Martinsville in the spring, second at New Hampshire, third at Gateway, seventh and fourth at Richmond. Again, this rules package is different than that that was used at all those tracks I just listed, except Gateway, I think. But still, something about shorter ovals seems to play to Joey Logano's strengths this year. And never count out Paul Wolf's ability to play some sort of bold strategy, Logano to get the most out of the car, just like last week at Kansas. They gained 10 points just on that final overtime restart and strategy play. So I'm giving Logano a 7, sorry, a 7 out of 10. Next is Christopher Bell, who won at Bristol earlier this year, but it was Bristol dirt. I don't know if that means anything. He did lead over 100 laps in this race a year ago and finished 4th. He's won back-to-back -back poles to start these playoffs. He was top 10 at both other concrete tracks this year, Nashville and Dover. I should be really high on Christopher Bell, but I just do not trust this team. 
I especially don't trust the pit crew, numerous mistakes, slow stops the past two weeks, but I also don't fully trust the driver. Christopher Bell feels like he's pointed the wrong direction almost once a week at this rate. He was clutch in the playoffs last year, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to give him a six out of 10 on my advance meter Next up is Chris Busher. He's only 13 points to the good, but I'm very confident in Busher. He won this race one year ago, and RFK as an organization has only gotten better. If not for that flat tire late last week at Kansas, they would have, I believe, seven straight top 11 finishes this season with obviously three wins mixed in there. So Chris Busher, I'm giving him a nine, a nine on my advance meter scale. That's how confident I am. How about Ross Chastain? This is an interesting pick because he won Nashville early in the summer, a concrete track. He was sixth in this race one year ago. I'll give Ross a seven. He's looked good these first two playoff races. Not great, but good. He did snap a nine race top five list streak at Darlington two weeks ago. So as long as he stays out of trouble, Chastain should be good to move on. Kyle Busch, plus 24. Back-to-back Saturday struggles have forced this team to play from behind these first two playoff races. They can't have Saturday struggles this week because the race is on Saturday night. That would ruin their season. But he's an eight-time Bristol winner. There's no one better at Bristol historically in the Cup Series today than Kyle Busch. So in honor of him driving the eight car, I'll give him an eight on the advance-ometer scale. Ryan Blaney is a tough one. He has been caught up in a number of crashes at Bristol over the years. Last year, he blew a right front early while running inside the top five. Then if I remember, he had a wheel fall off as well, leaving pit road, just completely derailed his race a season ago. They've brought decent cars to these first two playoff races, you know, maybe seventh to 10th place equipment, which is good. But if a mistake or a spin or an issue puts him behind Saturday night, I don't know if that's enough speed to recover. He is plus 25 points, though. It will likely take something devastating to knock him out. So I'll still give Ryan Blaney a 6 out of 10 on the advance meter But you know, before these playoffs began, I had Blaney out in the first round. Not looking great for me thus far, but you know, I got to at least hedge my bets. I still have to stick to my pre-playoffs guns at least a little bit. I think Denny Hamlin, William Byron, they're more than 40 points to the good. Even Truex, who had probably the worst race possible last week, only lost like 32 points to the cut line. So I think Hamlin, Byron are probably safe, fingers crossed. So the last driver I want to talk about is Brad Keselowski. Brad has led laps in six straight Bristol races. And I mentioned his teammate, Chris Buescher, won here a year ago. That was only possible because Brad Keselowski unfortunately cut a tire while leading late in the race. Again, RFK is better now than they were a year ago. 33-point cushion. I'm giving Brad a 9. Very confident in the two RFK Fords this weekend, as I'm sure many are. Ah, But there's one final look at the playoff grid going into the final race of the round of 16. I had McDowell, Stenhouse, and Bubba missing before the playoffs started. Those picks are looking pretty good. Again, I had Blaney out instead. Blaney's done pretty well to start these playoffs. Looking at the cut line, I think Truex will leapfrog Harvick. The question then just comes down to, will someone from up here wreck or have something mechanical fail on them that knocks them even lower? That's really the only question in my opinion. But let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Which four drivers do you believe get eliminated Saturday night? I love Bristol. I love the night race. Such a fun, exciting, tense night. I'm looking forward to it. But that's going to do it for this episode, y'all. I appreciate you sticking with me. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. We talk NASCAR every single day. The playoffs are here. Things are just now getting spicy. And as always, a big thank you to my Patreon supporters for your very generous support. Don't mind me just knocking my microphone around. That is going to do it. Thank you all so much for watching. I will see you again later this week. And don't forget Dale Jr. also racing the Xfinity race tomorrow night. So a lot to look forward to. I will see you again soon. Have a good one, y'all.